Hi everyone, I am Tiago. I'm going to be talking about Neuroepileptic, a fast hyperbolic relaxation solver uh, for neuroactivity initiative. Uh, so we, uh, the paper is on the archive. There's also like the official published version at uh, this uh, This was done in collaboration with Leo Wernick, Aaron Spierre Jack, and Zach Etienne. They, they are all here. Um, okay. So what is the NERPIPLUS code? It's an extensible initial data solver leveraging the NERPIPLUS framework. Uh, so with the NERPIPLUS framework, uh, uh, you can use Python simple expressions for generating highly optimized C code. Uh, so uh, as a first application, we are generating binary puncture uh, initial data. So uh, our solver is based on the hyperbolic relaxation method uh, published by Ruder et al. Uh, they have already done numerical relativity initial data for uh, binary Eastern stars and scalar feuds using that method. Uh, so I'm going to be talking uh, here mostly about you know this new optimization. Uh, oh, I'm start doing this, okay? Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking about this new prescription that makes the solver orders of magnitude faster over the original wrote. And that has to do with the fact that we will be having relaxation waves that accelerate exponentially to the outer boundary. Uh, you know, this will be explained in detail. And also, uh, I think, very nice thing about neuroepileptic, as with all NERPIPLUS based codes, um, uh, it has uh, lower barrier of entry, uh, and you know because it's easy to use, well documented in Jupyter notebooks, and also the uh, NERPI elliptic uh, transforms a elliptic equation into a hyperbolic equation uh, by introducing a time uh, pseudo time coordinate, so that you can use standard uh, time evolution techniques for solving these boundary value problem, uh, which is an elliptic equation. So what are the features of NERPILIPTIC? Uh, now it's being made open source. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, you can uh, go to this tinyurl.com. Uh, maybe Leo can uh, uh, paste it in the chat if people uh, think it's useful. Uh, so there you will find uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks with a you know, basic equations, uh, you know, using the SymPy and NERPIPLUS framework, where you can type the, the expressions and, and basically uh, implement them. And then you also find uh, a start to finish Jupyter notebook where we really generate the C code. We run with the mid res resolution because um, you can always change the resolution. And then we have some diagnostics. So we plot the uh, uh, L2 norm of the residual. We, we have some, uh, you know, nice um, 2D plots of the residual as a function of the relaxation time, so on. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, so it has a standalone version, and also it has a nice Juki thorn that was, uh, you know, Leo worked very hard on the thorn. Uh, it's also an open source. It's, uh, it's in the same, uh, uh, you know, GitHub repository. Uh, so also, I think this is a feature because the code is undergoing active development. So uh, new features uh, will be added in the next year and beyond. So we're going to be extending the mathematical formulations, uh, you know, coding up different types of initial data. So, uh, and there's also a growing community of NERPI plus developers and users where we can get help, we can collaborate. Uh, so I think this is a very nice thing. Um, and the NERPI plus code generation makes it easier to extend the code and solve other elliptic systems. So it's often the case that it's complicated for you to modify an existing elliptic solver because, uh, you know, even though it's very efficient, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, very smart people put a lot of time and effort into making those codes. But if you're uh, just interested in, you know, changing uh, the solver for uh, solving your own, own problems, it might be, it might be hard. Uh, so the, the the main idea here is, uh, you know, being extensible and, and um, you know, easy to modify and easy to get started and easy to use, and also being fast enough. And I'm going to cover that as well. So what is uh, what kind of equations can we solve? Just just in general, this is an elliptic system of equations. So um, u is a vector of uh, unknowns. Um, L is an elliptic operator. 
uh, rho is the vector of source terms. And here uh, we are saying uh, boundary conditions to zero at infinity. Of course, other choices are possible. Uh, and so we, we want to solve this type of problem. So notice that uh, the source term can also be sourced by the vector of unknown. It's a nonlinear problem as it is in binary point initial data. So how does the hyperbolic relaxation method work? You start off with the original uh, elliptic system of equations or the elliptic equation, uh, and you include a couple of things. So this hyperbolization method is inspired by the gamma driving shift condition. So you notice that we have a wave speed because you know, it's going to be a wave function, okay? So a wave, a wave equation. So uh, we, we have a wave speed. We also have pseudo time coordinates uh, and uh, the NP parameter. So the NP parameter multiplies the first um, you know, time derivative of the, the unknown variable we want to solve for. And uh, this is uh, related to the dissipation. So the numerical errors are dissipated uh, uh, with this term here. And also we want to make the equation hyperbolic. Uh, so we have a second time derivative. So, so th this is really the, the prescription. So we transform an elliptic equation into a hyperbolic equation by introducing this pseudo time coordinate, first in time, uh, uh, first and second time derivatives and a damping parameter. And now we can numerically solve this equation using standard hyperbolic PDE methods as opposed to more specialized elliptic solvers. Um, because arguably they're easier to implement, they're easier to, to use the hyperbolic solvers. Um, okay, so U evolves into pseudo time coordinate and exponentially approaches a steady state in which both first and second time derivatives will vanish. When those vanish, of course, we will recover the solution to the original uh, elliptic problem. So really we are interested in the steady state solution. Okay, so uh, as I said in the beginning, the first application of NERP elliptic is binary punctual initiative. Uh, so uh, Halvey VTAC gave a very nice introduction to the mathematical foundations of numerical activity. And so uh, we have to solve or the Hamiltonian constraint equation, so the first equation, and the momentum constraint equations. So this is our task when we are uh, in vacuum space times, of course, so we don't have, uh, you know, matter source terms. And so uh, this is just, a, you know, a very uh, brief, uh, uh, you know, summary of what goes into the conformal transverse traceless or the CTT formalism. Uh, so the first thing, the physical three metric is decomposed uh, a, a in such a way that every, uh, you know, it's a, it's a conformal uh, transformation. So every component of the metric um, uh, is described as psi, psi is the conformal factor to the power of fourth uh, times a conformally related metric or just a conformal metric. Uh, so we also introduce AIJ, which is the trace-free extrinsic curvature. So um, K is the trace of the extrinsic curvature. So you just subtract this from the extrinsic curvature. Uh, and also in this formulation, you have the conformal trace-free extrinsic curvature. So what are the assumptions? Uh, maximum slicing, which translates into uh, the trace of the extrinsic curvature is zero. Conformal flatness, which means that the conformal metric is the flat spatial metric in the chosen coordinate um, system that you have. Uh, we also have asymptotic flatness. So uh, at you know, spatial infinity, the conformal factor goes to one. Um, and there's an also an extra assumption of the conformal extrinsic curvature. It's more like mathematical evolved. So, um, and you can see the original paper, I'll see the documentation that I'm gonna show you uh, later. Okay, so when you put in all those um, uh, you, you know, uh, prescriptions. So this is what we find. First of all, the momentum constraint equations will have exact solutions. So we don't have to, you know, in this formulation, we don't have to solve for the uh, momentum constraint equations. We only have to solve for the Hamiltonian constraint equation. And so once you put in all those assumptions, that's what the Hamiltonian constraint equation 
uh, looks like. Um, so this uh, the Laplacian in, in this uh, you know conformal space uh, acted, and then you have the contraction of the um, trace-free conformal extrinsic curvature. So there's an issue that um, these conformal factor uh, can have a singular piece, and so this would spoil your numerical algorithm. And so uh, to amend this problem, we follow uh, this reference here, and then we um, I split the conformal factor into singular and non-singular piece. So basically, singular piece is uh, you know represents a black hole with no spin and no linear momentum, and then uh, u is the variable we solve for. So it's a correction term uh, to the conformal uh, factor. Okay. So in terms of the Conformal factor, uh, you know, the, the non singular piece of the conformal factor, this is what the Hamiltonian constraint equation uh, looks like. So, this is the equation we will be solving using our elliptic. Okay, so once again, uh, to recap, the hyperbolization of this equation is a trivial procedure. Uh, you only have to include uh, wave speed, you know, the per, you know, pseudo time coordinate, first and second time derivatives, yeah. and a damping parameter. That multiplies the first okay. derivative. And okay, so uh, we want to uh, solve this as a first order uh, system of equations. So, to that extent, we uh, define this auxiliary variable v. So, v is just um, first time derivative of u plus eta damping times u. So, the equation, the evolution equation for you. Evolution is this pseudo time coordinate, of course. So this evolution equation for you, it just comes from the definition of the auxiliary variable. And then, uh, so the evolution equation for V is uh, C squared times really the, the constraint evaluation. So the, so in, um, in NERP elliptic, in, in, in most NERP plus base codes, we always refer to whatever comes to the right of the you know time derivatives of your evolved variables at the right hand sides. So when whenever I mention the right hand sides of u, right hand sides of, of v, so I mean like whatever comes to the right of the you know time evolution. Good. So the radiation boundary condition. Uh, so as I said, this is um, uh, wave. You know we 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 have transformed an elliptic equation into a wave equation, and. Uh, so our boundary is finite. It doesn't extend to infinite. So we need boundary conditions at, uh, you know, where our boundary ends. And uh, so we, we need a boundary condition that minimizes un undesired reflections at the outer boundary. So uh, this was implemented by my colleague Terence Pierre-Jacques, um, who will also be speaking uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, and so basically for any evolved variable, you have the... Uh, you know, asymptotic value of this variable at, at um, spatial infinity. You have this term here that represents the Nauti going wave that solves the wave equation in spherical symmetry. And here's you have here you have a correction term, so uh, you know next order uh, correction uh, that is taken care of and this um, boundary condition uh, driver. Okay, so. We have the equations cast as a you know first order system, hyperbolic first order system. We have the boundary conditions. So now we have to talk about the numerical grids. And so this is a typical grid structure uh, that we use uh, in your elliptic. So it's a we use prolate spheroidal like coordinates. It's very similar to the two punctures code, but that, as I said, the coordinates are not compactified. So um, here, this coordinate system has two foci, and that's where exactly where we place the punctures, because that's where we need the most resolution. So notice that the the grid is not is not evenly spaced. So it's um, you know the resolution is much higher here. You have a lot more grid points near the punctures, and then as you go away towards the outer boundary, uh, it, the the grid is coarser because you know, most of the features that you want to resolve are, are located near the punctures. And so, uh, as I emphasized several times, um, the this is a uh, time evolution. Uh, yes? Uh, 
Yes, yes, it's single domain method. Yeah, we just have one. Yeah, uh, yeah. So and uh, so as I, as I said, this is a time evolution method. So we need a delta t because we use like a Runge Kutta for evolution method for the time. So we discretize the spatial part using finite differences, and we have like Runge Kutta for the spatial uh, evolution, uh, the time evolution. So we need a delta t. So that's the time steps that we take to go from t0 to t1, t1 from t2, and so on, to, to march our solution forward in time. And because of numerical stability or, or in the CFL condition, uh, we cannot take uh, time steps that are very large. Uh, in fact, those time steps are you know, constrained or dictated by the smallest grid spacing that we have uh, re uh, precisely near uh, the punctures. And so because we have a lot of resolution there, the grid spacing is very small, like uh, m times 10 to the minus 4. So it will be a very, very slow solver if we, you know, because we are constrained with these time steps. But the trick here uh, is that the relaxation waves are not physical. Uh, we, are, we have this artificial uh, wave equation, but really we're interested in the steady state solution, you know, the regime in which first and second time derivatives will vanish. So we are free to modify the wave equation because the relaxation isn't physical. And so this is how we do it. Uh, so we, everywhere in this numerical domain, we uh, set the wave speed in proportional to the grid spacing. So uh, for instance, at the outer boundary, the wave speed is a million times faster than the wave speed near the punctures. And so this really gives a speed up to, to, the, to the method to the point that it's you know, uh, competitive against you know, other solvers that use more uh, you know, uh, methods that are uh, you know, based on linear algebra methods or pseudo-spectral methods and so on. Um, so this is, uh, this is essential to, to the competitiveness of an elliptic. Okay, so uh, here I'm showing um, so some snapshots uh, of the relaxation for, so we are generating a initial data for a quasi-circular uh, orbit, uh, mimicking the GW150914 example. It's uh, one of the gallery examples that the Einstein took it. Um, so notice that we start with initial gas, vanishing initial gas, and the uh, errors converge exponentially in this pseudo time uh, coordinate until we, you know, satisfy the constraint equations, uh, you know, to desired um, accuracy. So here we are uh, comparing a uh, neuroleptic to against the trusted two punctures uh, solution, and, and so and this is what we want to emphasize: the exponential convergence in, in time. Okay, so um, uh, here I'm going to show you uh, so how you know the residual as computed uh, within the neuroleptic solver. Um, evolves in, in, in time um, in, in this XZ uh, plane. So you see like the, there's a burst, like some sort of like initial burst, and then uh, the residual keeps dropping, um, as you can see, getting, getting darker. And so here I stopped because it's uh, <clears throat> only 20, like the punctures, yeah, the punctures are located at plus and, and minus five. And so this, uh, it's, a, it's a box that goes from minus 20 to 20. So this is a larger box. Uh, you cannot see the two punctures. You can only see one here, uh, but then um, you can appreciate you know, the uh, <clears throat> wave-like behavior of the solver. Okay, and you can see like we are re reaching our round up there. Yeah. Uh, this is a, is a measure of um, convergence in the neuroleptic code. So it's uh, computing the residual within the neuroleptic solve. So we wanna, uh, okay, we want a fair comparison now. Um, so we want to compare the initial data generated with neuroleptic against the initial data generated by two punctures, which is a widely used uh, thorn in the Einstein toolkit. And so to do so, and, and to do a fair comparison, we have to start with initial data that have, uh, you know, the same levels of uh, error. So we elected some resolution in both codes, and, and then we have, you know, the errors along the z-axis where the punctures are located. And 
So after one orbital period, I am uh, plotting the uh, Hamiltonian constraint violation uh, in this x y plane. So you know because here we have rotated uh, the, the the data because just like yeah, in the isotopic devolution, the x is you know the punctures are along the x axis. So just this is just a simple rotation, and, and then. After one orbital period, remember this is a Pfizer circular uh, initiative. So, in, on the left hand side, you have the Hamiltonian constraint violation, um, you know, as computed by inner elliptic. And on the right hand side, you have the Hamiltonian constraint violation as computed, not, not using the initial data from inner elliptic and two punctures involving the same, you know, the initial data using the same evolution code. And you see that uh, it leads to very comparable Hamiltonian constraint violations, which means that. Both initial data are good enough. Uh, and, you know, they, the numerical errors are dictated by the time evolution of the algorithm, you know, the BSSN equations in implementation, and not by the initial data. So uh, we can use neuropenoptic for production runs. Uh, it's, it's the bottom line from this plot. Uh, so uh, this is a summary of this part of my presentation. Uh, we are about, you know, 20 minutes, and then I'm going to be showing you. Uh, what the documentation looks like, how you can use it, how you can navigate it, um, and, you know, using the uh, Jupyter notebooks. So, um, so as a summary, uh, you know, neuropeleptic uses standard time evolution techniques instead of uh, specialized, more specialized techniques. Uh, it's now open source. Uh, I gave a tiny URL in the beginning, but this is like the, the actual link to the uh, repository. Uh, it has a, a detailed documentation. Um, uh, and, you know, I argue that it can be easily extended to other elliptic problems. And that's gonna, what I'm going to be showing, like how you would uh, go about, you know, extending and modifying and navigating the, you know, generation of the equations uh, with this uh, wave speed, uh, you know, uh, that, you, you know, increases exponentially to the outer boundary. Uh, it's much faster than the original hyperbolic relaxation uh, formulation. Uh, and so it's still, at the current version, our solver is around six times lower than two punctures. Uh, but, um, so it, but, but if you take the time it takes to generate the initial data plus the actual evolution time, you know, this is 0.15% of the simulation time. It's just a couple of minutes. And as an exchange, we gain a lot more flexibility. Uh, and, you know, we have a solver that's easier to extend. Um, but anyways, we want to make it fast, uh, so it's even comparable or, or, or better. So we envision just, you know, having better initial guesses, you know, possibly coupled with multi-grid methods. So you use, use NERP-elliptic as a solver within the multi-grid approach. But also, you know, more importantly, we're going to be using the more optimal uh, black holes at home grid structures. So this is um, uh, a multi-patch grid uh, uh, that is being um, developed by uh, Zach Etienne. And, and then, well, here we would have a lot more um, freedom in choosing the resolution around each black hole, which would make it ideal for an equal mass uh, ratio binaries. So on the application side, um, just would like to um, uh, remind you that what I said in the beginning, it has already been done for binary neutron stars using the conformal thing sandwich approach. So this was done, uh, you know, in the paper where they introduced the hyperbolic relaxation method. Uh, but, you know, we envisioned some other applications, for instance, uh, BNS or uh, black hole neutron size binaries, spinning neutron stars, uh, binary black holes coupled to scalar fields, which is, which is something that, you know, has gathered the interest of a lot of people. And really, uh, we want the solver to be flexible enough so that you can, you can use to implement your own elliptic equations. Uh, so I noticed, so, uh, so next I'm, I, I want to show you, I noticed there are some questions. So, um, should I wait until the end and take the call or it's, this is a natural, okay. There's some questions that might be relevant. Okay, maybe I'll wait then and then I'll answer all the questions. So this is the repository. Uh, you can clone the repository. So this is, uh, if you have cloned this, this is what you will see. Um, so I already have uh, here 
a C codes directory where I have generated all the C codes already. So if you run this yourself, you would end up with the C codes underscore notebook. So that will just really reproduce uh, what we already have. And well, let me just uh, go to the basic equations first. Okay. So this is what a uh, you know typical. Um, would you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, sure. Control plus. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is what a typical NERP plus documentation uh, you know will look like. So you have a table of contents which is clickable. And you can always um, go back to the top. You can access any uh, subsection. And uh, so we, and we, we always um, document a um, you know, Python uh, tutorial. You know, in the Python tutorial, we always document a Python module. So at, at the top, you can click here and you can access the actual uh, Python codes that um, are being documented here. And okay, and so here uh, you you will find just a, you know a very brief introduction to the solver, um, a review of the basic uh, the basic equations, uh, the formalism you know uh, very similar to the paper, um, and so on. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, the when I said we, you decompose the conformal factor in, into a singular piece and a non-singular piece. So this is uh, the non-singular, uh, the singular piece of the conformal factor have the bare masses, the, the positions of each puncture. Um, and it turns out that this is the solution. There's an equation V here, uh, this, this vector V here is what solves the uh, momentum constraint equations. And it, it is used for computing the extrinsic curvature. So, because this is not a tutorial, this is a talk. I'm just, you know, uh, you know, demonstrating the, the, the um, documentation, how we would navigate it. I'm not going to go, you know, you know, through each cell, you know, in, with a lot of detail. But I encourage you, if you're interested, to um, to go there. So, as I said, this is the the system of equation that we. Um, are solving using NERP elliptic. So here's where you would um, uh, import all the necessary modules for uh, generating the equations. Uh, you know, these are all NERP plus, you know, and also SIMPI. Uh, here I said the dimension is the, the, the dimension of the physical space. So we just set it to, to three. And here um, is where you would define all the parameters. So, um, you know, the NERPI has a, you know, a parameter infrastructure. And so you can define any parameters you want. So we have the bare masses of each puncture. Um, we have the positions of each puncture. Uh, for puncture, I call it zero. You know, when, when accuracy underscore zero is one, it's the one, you know, I, I put it in the plus. Z direction and the score one in the minus Z direction, which is really our, you know, just a choice. Uh, and you have, uh, so I create, you know, we have the linear momenta, no, yeah, the linear momenta in each, uh, you know, coordinate X, Y, and Z for each puncture. Um, here, just create a, a vector with those coordinates. You have the angular momentum as well uh, for each puncture. And I, I create, um, you know, I rank to for just for storing those. Again, I'm not going to go into like a lot of details. I'm just going to mention to you, and, and you can, you know, do, during your own time, uh, go through this. And so here, where we define the coordinate system, so a, a NERPI, the coordinate system is called the Sinch SIMTP, uh, and that's where you would choose it. And so we have uh, the numerical grids in NERPI. And also we have the uh, Cartesian, uh, you know, Cartesian uh, components. And this is uh, where I, I define the relative, you know, positions of the punctures. Um, okay, so uh, here I'm just defining um, um, functions for computing the dot product and the cross product. Um, uh, you know, the NERP has this Levitch beta symbol. You can just use that. Okay, so this is um, so as I as I mentioned in the beginning, 
I don't, you know, we don't need to know all the details about this expression, but for instance, this is an expression that you would need to um, uh, code uh, with uh, uh, NERPI. So we always like to have the LaTeX version of the expression and then immediately followed by the uh, Python uh, implementation. Uh, so here we are, <clears throat> uh, so this is the, the absolute value X, sub n is the absolute value of the uh, relative uh, position of the puncture. So um, I'm just calling this R. So I initialize with zero because it has to be a, a, a sin pi uh, variable. And then I just compute the uh, squares and take the square root. And, and then uh, next I define um, a rank one tensor or just a vector using the index expression uh, module of um, NERPI plus. And it's, um, so here you see, uh, for instance, for each coordinate, uh, uh, you know, zero, one, two, X, Y, and Z, you would have um, rational. So this you have seven over four, this is what you see here. And so you have the linear momentum vector this is what you see here, divided by R, and then plus uh, this one over four. So they have the dot, dot product between X and P. This is what you see here, uh, times the vector X divided by R to the power of three. And the other term would be uh, you know, one over R cubed, and then the cross product between X and S. Uh, so we have, we, so now we have um, this function that will compute uh, this vector V for a single, uh, for a single puncture, okay? And then uh, if you wanna do like two puncture initial data, you, you would need a superposition. And so we would just sum this. So here I have uh, just a quick example of how, you know, what, how, you know, what can you do? Like where, where the NRP uh, comes in. So let's say uh, we're gonna use this function that I have just defined that, you know, codes up this uh, expression here. Uh, so I'm calling this function here, you know, when we were um, here at the top, when we have the, um, the parameters, I have already defined um, X, um, you know, the relative velocity. So this is um, already defined. Anyways, so uh, bottom line is I can call X, P and S. So this is the uh, position, linear momentum and, and uh, spin for the puncture zero. So one of the punctures, okay? So I just call this function here that I just defined. And uh, let's say you just wanna see, uh, just for the sake of, uh, you know, correctness, you wanna check that, you know, the, the function in senpai, um, you can always just print if you, if you wanna see like a, this version, but if, if you wanna see the tag code, you can, you can just type the, you have to have that later installed. And then you can, you can see that, well, we have cart x, uh, in, in RP is really the X, you know, in Cartesian coordinates and so on. So you can see uh, seven over four. Five minutes. And then, um, you know, P. So of course this is the uh, zero uh, component. And then you have, this would be a dot product. And, you know, you can see, okay. So how would you use, um, how would you use uh, uh, NERPI for generating, for instance, uh, C code that you can actually use for your, uh, you know, simulations. So this is how you would do it. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, it's all, it's, it's done in the start to finish tutorial, but this is just an example. So we have this uh, uh, list, this Python list, and we have those variables here. And if, so if you want to, you can use this function called output C, which is uh, in the output C module. And then, so here uh, you see the original um, SIMPI expression. And here, this is uh, where, uh, you know, one of the things that will make, you know, NERPI plus shine, it's because it will recognize expressions there appear, like repeated expressions there appear, and we'll use common sub-expression elimination. 
and then it will define temporary variables for you. And it will just, and you can uh, just define, this is a C code and it, you, you, can, you can define this, uh, this quantities in C. Of course, the rest of, in the rest of the tutorial, you, you know. Uh, so, so the, the, Okay. In the rest of the, the this uh, notebook, I, I just finished the implementation. You can you can check out yourself. Um, so, for instance, the conformal extrinsic curvature is implemented here. Uh, you you need derivatives of this um, vector v that I that I just computed. You know, you're not supposed to. You know, uh, it, we don't have enough time to go into the details, but th this is what you would do. And also, you can uh, compute the um, uh, singular piece of the conformal uh, fact, uh, uh, factor. That's what I do here. And I compute the right-hand sides. And so the, the right-hand side of the time evolution for you, the right-hand side of the time evolution for V, uh, this is what I do here. And then the, at the very end, um, I just call all, all the functions that I have defined. And I have a quick test uh, where I just um, call the Python module and use this function that is in our unit test repository. It compares the what we have just implemented and the trusted you know NERP uh, elliptic um, uh, repository. And then if they are the same, it passes this test. You know, it's just for a you know, sanity check. And also for you know, it, it does this for the side background, the contraction of the extrinsic uh, trace free extrinsic Minutes. curvature, and then for the right hand sides. Uh, it, it passes this this test. So in this start to finish, um, uh, if you this is, will create the you know the playground, uh, the C code uh, that will um, just create uh, you know the standalone version of Neuroleptic. Uh, again, um, you are well, welcome to check out this, and we we just you know we like to define most of our free parameters at the top. Uh, we call the the neuroleptic code generation uh, um, uh, modules, and we generate the expressions. And here we generate you know the method of, the method of lines, uh, the initial guess, um, you know all the functions for. Uh, you know the extrinsic curvature. You know the the wave speed that you know increases exponentially. Minute, uh, I would argue that I had three three minutes. But then, <laughs> according to my <laughs> okay, um, okay. So yeah, so if you run these for yourself, you would see um, you know everything here. And at the very end, we have like a nice exponential um, you know, convergence plot. And so we're plotting the residual as a function of uh, you know, the time steps. And we also uh, generate- seconds. Please conclude. <laughs> okay, so to conclude, uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you have the standalone version uh, here, uh, underscore C codes and the ET, which stands for Einstein toolkit. So uh, all the, you know, Thorn is here. We will be adding documentation for the Thorn as well in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you. Let's start with the online question. Sure. Uh, so the first one was a question about the outer boundary condition. Is it feasible to do characteristic decomposition and soft imposition of the boundary condition? Uh, I haven't tested. What I can say is that the um, Sommerfeld radiation boundary conditions uh, work really, really great. They really minimize the dissipation. I haven't tried. Uh, I, I encourage you to, you know, give it a try. Um, and, you know, tell me if it is or not. So the second question is, uh, when you showed that movie, the x equals zero, or the z axis, uh, seems to lag the rest of the domain in relaxation. Will it reach a prescribed level eventually, or is there a hard limit? Uh, what what I what I, um, what I can see whenever I see uh, the 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 relative errors are always very homogeneous across the whole domain when we really reach the steady states. Uh, in this in this movie, well, I didn't show the. Uh, I, I think I think I mean this right. 
Yeah, I think you can show this one. That's right. That that one shows. Yeah, yeah. Character. So we we have like some you know uh, right at the puncture we have like maybe an order of magnitude worse, but uh, everywhere else is very homogeneous. And this is along the z axis. Yeah, this is. Yeah, this is. Yes, yes. So this is shows. the axis that. Uh, yes. Yes. Permission. Yeah. And the last question was, uh, was the comparison the two functions made for an equal mass system? Did you also compare the results with an unequal mass? So this is unequal mass. The mass ratio is about 1.2. Uh, this is already unequal mass. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so we have just a few more questions. Um, any other ones? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the nice question. Uh, I was wondering if you can share some of the insights when you switch from the um, I guess, um, so it really depends on the uh, damping parameter. So the relaxation can be made faster if you choose the correct damping parameter. So we had a lot of experimentation here. Uh, but other than that, um, and also, you know, th this is the trick, like the idea that we came up with, uh, the, you know, Finding um, wave speeds that really accelerates uh, uh, the relaxation, but also satisfies the CFL condition everywhere. So this is really essential. I think I think this is where you know this code really shines. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was curious with regard to the to uh, do you see at some point where you have a, uh, a point where this won't work for an asymmetric binary? Like, is there a limit to like how asymmetric the binary can be in a discord that can break down? Um, no, I think uh, I think just like in two punctures, because it's a single domain, you really have to crank up the resolution. So if you have a, a asymmetric, so you have to resolve the smallest one. I think. So yes. And it's the motivation to use the black holes at home grid, migrate to that or the highly unequal mass. So we just have a tiny bit over a minute. Uh, yeah. So what's the expected order of convergence of your hyperbolic So after it has relaxed, relaxed, so if you do like the spatial convergence is between nine and 10th order. Using their order. Yeah, because it's 10th order finite differences. And someone asked about the damping parameter is a constant. One minute. Yeah, I think that was the damping parameter. Yeah,